Hello. Hello, everyone. Woo! We're here. Still feels great to say that. We're here, live in person, guys. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting. Everybody's chatting. So it's been so loud. Have you guys noticed? It's been wonderful to hear all the human voices chatting. It really has been beautiful. Thanks for coming back. Thanks, digital audience. We see you multitasking at home, doing something or at work, so doing something cool. Uh, and thanks, you guys, for being present. It's really lovely to see you in person. All right. We are ready. Uh, Soren will be discussing now uh, with Richard Davidson the path of well-being. Richard Davidson is the founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is likely the foremost researcher in the world on mindfulness and well-being. He is a friend and confidant of the Dalai Lama. He just got back from a trip to the Vatican. <laughs> and he's a leader of cutting-edge conversations on well-being around the globe, clearly. So Richard and Soren, come on up. Thank you. So you got a lot to live up to. Wow, that's <laughs> impressive. I'd be nervous if I was you. Uh, I am. <laughs> Uh, it's really great to have you back. I think oh, it's we are wonderful to be here, especially in person. <laughs> um, we were speaking backstage, and you've taken a couple trips. I know you've you mentioned in COVID, but um, I was really, really honored that you were willing to kind of come out and be in person with us. So thank you so much. Well, I, we have, I think, lulled ourselves into thinking Zoom is <laughs> a, a, an effective substitute, and it's certainly okay, but yeah. this is much better. Beautiful. Um, so we're here to talk about mindfulness, we're here to talk about well-being, and I know there's like 10,000 different directions we could take this, um, but I thought we would start with, early on, uh, there was a meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I believe. Was that the moment that kind of launched you into bringing your interest in contemplation and interest in science together to help uh, show the world or describe to the world what is beneficial, or was it before that? What was the, what was the hook that kind of like set your life path? Well, I had been interested in meditation before I met His Holiness for the first time, which was in 1992. Uh, but it was that meeting in 1992 where he asked me, uh, really, uh, in a, such a simple uh, and yet um, profoundly disruptive way, he said, why can't I use the same tools of neuroscience that I was using at that time to study depression and stress and anxiety and fear mm -hmm. and use those tools to study kindness and compassion. <laughs> and it was, you know, a very <laughs> simple question and I had no, I couldn't give him a good answer other than that it's hard. Um, but uh, that was really a, a pivotal moment for me. And I knew that I could not go back to my life as it was. Yeah. Um, that something needed to change and uh, that eventually gave rise to uh, our Center for Healthy Minds, which His Holiness came out to Madison to inaugurate in uh, 2010. And it was in uh, the, around 2000 that we first began to study long-term meditation practitioners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at his suggestion. Beautiful. Uh, and that's really the beginning of where all this work so you've had 30 years after that meeting, roughly, if I'm doing my math right. So what can you give us as some of the surprises and the highlights in the last 30 years of discovery? <laughs> Pretty much your full-time life is now dedicated to this, this inquiry. Uh, what are some of the things you've, you've learned, you've noticed that surprised you? Well, a few things. One is that um, human beings are wired to flourish. Hmm. Uh, this is part of our core DNA. And uh, the way I think about it is like language. It's not controversial to say that human beings are wired for language. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in order to express that propensity, we need to be raised in a normal linguistic mm -hmm. community. And there are actually case studies of feral children raised in the wild. They don't develop normal language. And similarly, if a human being is not raised in an environment where they have the inputs that allow them to flourish, 
they too will suffer. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one of the first things that I think is really important. And, and this is not an opinion. This is <laughs> hard no scientific fact. Um, there are really good data to show that infants come into the world with a propensity for pro-social behavior, mm -hmm. for kindness, for cooperation. This is the default. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if they grow up to be something different, it is because of the inputs that they've yeah. received. But this is our, our initial starting condition. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is really important. And, uh, uh, and so when we do practices to cultivate our heart, to cultivate kindness, those practices are not creating states and traits de novo, but rather, they're actually reminding us of our true nature mm -hmm. and, and nourishing that true nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, I think, really an important insight. Beautiful, beautiful. And now I know it, part of what has been discovered through that is you have these pillars of well-being, if you will. And I'm wondering if we could just touch on those, because I find them quite fascinating. And it seems like you've tried to kind of culminate your research into these four kind of areas, and I wonder if you could just kind of touch on those, because I find it very fascinating. Yeah, so thank you for asking. Um, and yes, so we have developed this framework uh, for understanding what we consider to be the plasticity of well-being. Um, uh, and what we try to do in coming up with this framework is use the very best of modern science, but also a, have it be deeply informed by the contemplative traditions, and to discern what the core um, uh, minimal elements are for human flourishing that exhibit plasticity, that can be trained. Uh, and here are the four. Uh, the first is awareness. And awareness is where mindfulness would be. Uh, it uh, importantly includes this capacity that is uh, certainly present in humans to a much greater extent than in any other species, and that is meta-awareness. What is meta-awareness? Meta-awareness is the capacity of a person to know what his or her mind is doing. Now, that may sound a little strange, but uh, I'm sure you've all had experiences of not knowing <laughs> what your mind is doing. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the favorite ones that you know I think all of us can relate to is uh, uh, we might be reading a book and reading each word on a page, and we might be reading one page and a second page, and after a few minutes we have no friggin' idea what we've just read. Our minds are lost. Yeah. Uh, and that's an example of an absence of mental awareness. But the moment we recognize, the moment we come back is a moment of mental awareness, and that can be trained. So, and, and meta-awareness is a critical fulcrum, if you will, a leverage point for all other kinds of transformation. Mm -hmm. The second pillar is connection, and connection is about qualities that are important for healthy social relationships. Qualities like gratitude, kindness, appreciation, compassion mm -hmm. are all part of connection. The third pillar is insight. And insight is a curiosity-driven self-knowledge, and literally knowledge of the self. Uh, the self is this entity that we have, that we construct. It's a narrative. And part of well-being is having a deep experiential understanding of this narrative. It's not so much changing the narrative. It's changing our relationship mm -hmm. to the narrative. And so can you give us, so the example of a narrative would be, I'm a successful person or I'm an unsuccessful person or I'm the best person or I'm the worst person. Yeah, and, and so unfortunately no, there are a lot of people who have a negative narrative, right. who have negative self-beliefs, mm -hmm. and they actually hold those beliefs to be a veridical mm -hmm. description of who they are. And um, so this strategy is uh, uh, not so much initially changing the narrative, but if we can see the narrative for what it is, mm -hmm. and we can appreciate how the narrative is constraining our construction of reality. Mm -hmm. And literally, our realities are constructed mm -hmm. uh, as a consequence of this narrative. Yeah. 
Uh, and so when we have insight into that, it's liberating. Mm -hmm. And it can really free us from constraints that are imposed mm -hmm. by this narrative. And the last pillar of well-being is purpose. Mm -hmm. And purpose is, again, not so much about trying to find something, quote, more purposeful to do with our lives, but rather how can we derive meaning and purpose in that which we do, even in presumably uh, or so-called pedestrian kinds of things, daily routine things. Can taking out the garbage be deeply connected to your sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. <laughs> so your, your wife tells you that probably a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, during, you know, it's been interesting during COVID because um, I've been home much more than yeah. I yeah. was before COVID. And it's actually enabled me to do those kinds of yeah. things on an everyday basis. And I always, every single day, I reflect on this. Wow. Um, wow. And it's really cool. And it, it, the, the, so another insight, you asked about these insights, yeah. is that it doesn't take much to actually get these systems associated with flourishing active mm. and influential in our experience, in our lives. Uh, and that's because we're, we're wired to flourish. Wow, wow. And the neuroplasticity will lean towards flourishing if we can just train it. Is that the understanding? Yes, although um, we're about to come out with a high profile paper, so stay tuned. I'm <laughs> sure you'll hear about it. But um, the, uh, the neuroplasticity is super important and it's also complicated. Okay. Um, it's complicated because don't assume that the structure of our brains is gonna change just like that. It won't. Yeah. Um, but the key thing is staying with it. Really having this be something you do day in and day mm -hmm. out. Uh, and that kind of regularity of practice, even if it's for a short time, mm -hmm. is really important. One of the things I like to remind people is that when human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. And I'll bet everyone here brushes their teeth. This is not part of our genome. <laughs> this is something that we've learned to do. And it's kind of amazing when you reflect on it that virtually everyone on the planet does it. Yeah. And if we spent even as short a time <laughs> as we spend brushing our teeth, nurturing our mind, and we do it every day, this world would be a different place. Oh, thank you. Um. One of the things, when we were talking some time back ago, and you said, um, you know, one of my practices, if I remember you correctly, says I go through my calendar, and I look at my calendar through the day, and I just stop for a moment, and I just send loving kindness to everybody who I'm meeting with that day. So I open up my calendar this morning, and I see an interview with Richie. And I'm like, oh, Richie's sending loving kindness to me right now. <laughs> and it was really sweet. And I was like, I'm going to send loving kindness to him. And then so when I saw you, I was like, ah. And I probably would have done that anyways. But it was just such a sweet moment to know that, like, I imagine you looking at your calendar and I'm looking at my calendar. I thought, what a lovely thing to do because most of us look at our calendars. But just to take, like, a 60 seconds, two minutes to be like, May you be free of suffering, X, Y, Z person I'm meeting on this, on this time. And then when you see them, and I thought, that's just a lovely practice. So thank you for that. Thank you. Do you have more things like that? that you <laughs> well, you know, I think it's these short moments. And, um, you know, I, 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 I love to do an appreciation practice around mealtime. All of us eat. We all eat several times a day. Mm -hmm. And simply reflecting on all of the people that it took to actually have a meal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's this extraordinary interdependent web. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and devoting even 30 seconds to appreciating mm -hmm. uh, this opportunity yeah. that we have is an elixir for the soul. Yeah. Now, is it okay, so if we, because I know there's this whole kind of question of longevity and longevity practices are now kind of in, in vogue. And, and there's these things that's like, oh, be loving, it's good for your skin or something. Um, <laughs> so when you do the studies, <laughs> how much does intention or motivation matter? So if, if I'm doing things because, does it, does it matter why I'm meditating every morning or why I'm doing X, Y, Z? Is the intention behind it matter? Or the fact that you're sitting there inquiring or appreciating matter. For example, yeah. I'm going to do this appreciation because I want the, the people I'm 
to make better food for me or something. So there's some other uh, incentive around it. Um, how, have you studied that in the lab and what's your sense of it, motivation? It's a wonderful question. We've thought a lot about it. Uh, uh, there is really no good scientific evidence one way or the other, but it's a really important question. And um, uh, one of the things that I have learned from the Dalai Lama is, I mean, he always asks uh, everyone when they're talking to him about whatever it is they're doing, what's your intent, what's your motivation for doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it, it invites the possibility that intention and motivation really is important. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and it also, you know, one of the things we think about these days is hybrid interventions. Um, so I'll introduce a new idea. Some of you can take and run with it, hmm. contemplative aerobics. Um, mm. So if you cultivate the intention just mm -hmm. before you're doing physical exercise, that I'm doing this physical exercise not only for my own health, but so I can be healthy and have vitality to serve others. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, beautiful. And, and one of the really interesting questions is whether the biological consequences of the exercise may actually be altered Enhanced. Mm -hmm. by the, this altruistic intention. Wow. We don't know the answer to that. Right, right. But it is an empirically tractable question. Right. It can be answered. So some, maybe it's so much what you do matters, but maybe more the spirit of what you do matters. That, that practice, if you're a uh, waiter or waitress in a restaurant, you delivering that meal with love and, and generosity could have an impact. It's, so it's not whether you're delivering the meal or not, but it's the how of how you're delivering the meal. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's, it's really important. And so what have you... What have, you, because, what have you understood about like, what brings happiness or what doesn't bring happiness? Because this is, seems to be connected to the sense of like, well-being. Um, do, do you have a sense of, like, are these four pillars of well-being, do they create a happy life, a content life? Is it just a life of health, healthy body, healthy mind? How do you, what's, the, what's the gauge, I guess, if I'm making any sense at all? Yeah, no, totally. And what, you know, we prefer to use terms like well-being and flourishing rather than happiness uh, for uh, some important reasons. Uh, and so just to give an anecdote, uh, I um, have had the blessing of being able to spend a lot of time around His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and kind of a model example of mm -hmm. a person who I think most people would agree has high levels of well-being and flourishing. And I've seen him, not, I've seen him in states where he's not happy, um, mm -hmm. where, uh, for example, he was told about um, uh, a situation with a Tibetan being tortured in a Chinese prison, and he was crying. Mm -hmm. um, he was deeply sad. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, he, I would say, still at that very moment, had very high levels of well-being, mm -hmm. and he was flourishing. Yeah. But he wasn't happy. Yeah. So it's not about being happy all the time. Yeah. Uh, but what it does, what flourishing does, is it changes our relationship to emotions, our dynamic range of emotions, and our capacity to exhibit emotions in a context-appropriate yeah. way. And so, you know, in that instance, His Holiness was deeply sad, but in the next moment, he saw something funny and burst out laughing. <laughs> uh, yeah. And having that fluidity yeah. is really a marker yeah. of flourishing. Beautiful. And how has technology impact all of this? <laughs> because I know that technology can both be this source of, of news and information and meditations and talks, and it can also be this source of overwhelm and distraction. Um, do you get a sense, what's your vision of how technology can aid in this process of human flourishing? Yeah, I mean, I, um, uh, I think technology is neutral. It, um, I, I don't think it's evil uh, in, inherently. Uh, and. Uh, I think it can be harnessed for the good. And you all have an app we should mention, the Healthy Minds. Yes, which um, <laughs> we're very happy to say that the New York Times Wirecutter named it as one of the three best meditation apps and the only one that's free, entirely free. Right. So, thank you. Thank you.
So any, yeah, any sense of where technology is going or what you would like to see technology do to guide us in this flourishing? Because if you look at the data, for at least the data I see, there's increasing despair, increasing unhappiness, increasing distraction, increasing loneliness. Like the, the, the national movement is not positive. Some of that's COVID, but some of that was even before COVID. Uh, absolutely. And so um, whatever we're doing doesn't seem to be <laughs> working on a, on a large national scale, maybe even a global scale. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts of how to make this well-being uh, movement, if you will, or effort expand to more and more people. And what are the, what are the, what, what are the, what are, what, who's not the enemy, so to speak, but who's our competitor in this? Yeah, no, these are really, really super important questions. And of course, all of you are um, believers in some level, but there are vastly larger quantities of people who are not in this room uh, who may really critically need strategies to improve their well-being, who don't even know uh, that it exists, don't, don't know that well-being can actually be trained. Um, and so we have a big task in front of us. And I think here's where technology can really be helpful. First, I think technology can be enormously helpful in measuring well-being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we are super excited about that possibility and we're devoting a lot of our energy to these measure, me, measurement strategies. The sort of gold standard today is for a person to fill out a retrospective questionnaire about basically how satisfied they are with their life. But we know that that's subject to <laughs> terrible biases. If you ask a person the same question on a day that's sunny versus a day when it's <laughs> raining and cloudy, you get totally different answers, even though you're asking them about their life in general. Right. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's a problem, and we know that there's a problem. Yeah. So we need better strategies, and here is where technology, I think, can be enormously helpful. Yeah. We know, for example, that there's a lot of information communicated in the face, in the voice, in the words we use. All of that can be harnessed mm -hmm. and uh, for, for measurement. And then if we can measure it in this way, we can also deliver um, sort of in the moment micro-interventions. We call it the micro-dosing of well-being. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, it, you, know, you can have a simple 30-second appreciation practice. Uh, you can, for one of the things we've learned during COVID is that um, we've worked, we've done a lot of work with public school teachers uh, who have been one group mm. highly stressed. And one of the things that they found most helpful in our approach is purpose that many of them said that for the first time since COVID, they're reconnecting with their purpose in becoming teachers in the first place. Yeah. And that is hugely beneficial for their resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if, we can, if they can do a 30 second practice to remind them of their purpose before they go in to yeah. teach for the day, that's the kind of thing that I think we really can use technology for that will yeah. be tremendously effective. Beautiful. And then how about the, the part around connection and human connection? Um, because you, I think you used the word connect, was it, what was the, the second pillar, was it connection? Connection. connection. Now, it would, could we translate that for community or no? Sure, absolutely. Okay, and then what is the purpose and the need? What, what makes, can we have a sense of community on Zoom or is it enhanced by in person? And what does science kind of tell us about, can we live a meaningful community connected life living through a screen? And what's the, what, what is the value of coming together like we're coming together? Yeah, those are great questions. And uh, you know, certainly I think that uh, we are fortunate to have had the technology that we, we do have to help us through COVID. Yeah. And I think connecting through Zoom and other video platforms uh, has certainly, in many cases, been incredibly yeah. helpful, mm -hmm. and it would have been more challenging had we not yeah, had that. Sure. Um, and yet, I also am firmly convinced that being together in person adds yet many other nuanced layers of connection that are extraordinarily important. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, we know that there are all kinds of signals that we provide to each other and to groups uh, that um, some of which are processed non-consciously, some of which we're aware of, but all of which contribute to this mm -hmm. um, precious uh, connection that we have with others and yeah. with 
uh, other species and with the planet uh, more generally. And, um, uh, and so I think that uh, there are ways to nurture this, uh, and I frankly think that the, the extraordinary um, deep challenges that we're in with climate change in part reflects this disintegration of connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think this is relevant to many different issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have a few minutes. We're going to have probably time for a couple questions. So if you want to stand up, there's a microphone there. Um, I don't know if we'll get to everyone, but um, briefly while they're lining up, longevity. Are you, are, were you doing a workshop on longevity or did I misunderstand somebody a while back ago? And how do you see that? What do we need to do or not do? Should we just be happy? Be, uh... Yeah, so longevity. So I'm not sure I may have participated in a workshop on longevity. <laughs> but um, so one of the things we've been very interested in is brain aging. Yeah, uh, well, a few of us are interested in that too. <laughs> yeah, so it, it turns out that um, if you look at the relationship between brain age and chronological age in a very large population, you'll see that they're very highly correlated, not surprisingly. And by the way, brain age is something that can be quantified completely objectively based on structural MRI scans. So it's not like holding up a scan and reading it like tea leaves or like a Rorschach, it's, it's totally wow. objective. Um, so we did some work and we actually published a case study of a very famous meditation teacher, um, Mingyur Rinpoche, who uh, has been in our lab on multiple occasions. And this allowed us to compute his brain age mm. uh, over the span of 12 years. Wow. Um, and he's been multiple times over the course of these 12 years, and we compared it to a normative database um, uh, with thousands of participants and uh, looked at the rate at which the brain is aging. So here are the two important conclusions. One is that Mingyur Rinpoche's brain does age. <laughs> so uh, anyone who tells you that you can reverse aging is feeding you snake oil. Um, the second is that his brain is aging much, much more slowly than 99% of the population. Uh, wow. And so he is in the most extreme tail of the distribution in terms of the slope of his brain aging over the course of this 12-year period. Wow. So um, we, we can do things and the kind of practices that he does and, and um, you know, at the first time that we tested him, the very first occasion, he had already logged, by conservative estimates, 62,000 hours of lifetime practice. Um, and so he's extremely rare. So we have some work to do. <laughs> yeah. We have work to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can see real structural change in the brain with a lot of practice. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Please. Hi, Richard. I am Rita Marie Johnson. I'm CEO of a global nonprofit that teaches the connection practice. And earlier we were asked, how do we grow love? And I'd like to share my answer to that and get your feedback. That'd be all right. I have to ask you to be very brief because yeah, we have two it, minutes for both of you. So. It's brief. So um, in my experience, uh, what we need to do to grow love is to know exactly when life comes at us with something that triggers us, how to efficiently get to our wisdom and how to efficiently get to our compassion and how to synergistically combine our wisdom and compassion so that we can respond creatively and peaceful to whatever has triggered us. Yeah, that's beautiful. You have any problems with that? No. Okay. I, I love that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but the problem has uh, been historically, when I look at what's happening in our world, is getting our high ideals and all of the knowledge that we have, all the neuroscience, down to the level where we're using it with youth offenders, which is what I'm doing actually right now in my county in Santa Clara. Uh, how we get that practical, how we get it grounded so that they know exactly what to do when life comes at them yeah. with Thank you. something. Thank you. Thank so, you. So we'll, let, let, let's, let's see yeah. your thoughts. On that. Thank you. I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. 
Well, uh, we're, I think those are important questions, and uh, uh, we're doing as much as we can do to bring this to many different sectors. There's a lot of, I would refer you to our website. We've done work with very challenged populations as well, uh, and um, have some ideas about how that might be done. All thank right. you. Thank, thank you. you for the work that you're doing. I think well, we have time for maybe one more, so uh -huh. thank you so okay. much. Okay. All right. We have a digital version, so we can do <laughs> exactly what I told you thank that you. needs to be done. Cool. Hi. Dr. Davidson, Arun Sardana, good to see you here again. Good and, to see uh, you. I want to first uh, thank you and congratulate you for bringing to the world the wisdom of thousands of years and making it freely available mm. to the largest populations. Thank you. Thank you. I think all of us need to applaud that. <laughs> thank, you so much. Um, thank you. The quick question after reading this wonderful book, Noise, by Daniel Kahneman, and you touched on the biases that come into our, into our world. The world of mindfulness is the world of silence, where answers arrive in silence. How can we take that at a community level and not use words to convince, to cajole, to impress, to move, they're necessary. But how can the practice of mindfulness and meditation at a, at a societal level use silence to lift our consciousness? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. And I would say that um, we need to do the work ourselves so that we embody the qualities that we wish to promote in others. And through our demeanor, not by talking about it, but through our demeanor, through our presence, to simply convey them. And we know that a lot of learning occurs at that nonverbal level. So we don't have to say anything. It can simply be through the exemplar of our demeanor and our being. So the next time you answer a question, he's just going to be silent. <laughs> well, so you're Soren, know. Soren goes back to the question you asked earlier. Can that Zoom environment deliver that same exact vibration? I, I don't think so. Yeah. That's my I'll, to all of you watching live stream, though, enjoy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes. It's better than, than not. Better than not. Dr. Richard Davidson, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so everybody else is blown away by that, as I was. Wow. Three things, man. Go home, think about three things from that talk, and then go do it. Like, go make change in that area. Number one for me, purpose for teachers. Number two for me, microdosing of well-being. And then, right? Why not, right? And then number three was, globally, let's make meditation as habitual and ubiquitous as brushing our teeth, right? Right? And mindfulness. So, all right. We're changing it out. Okay, here we go.